That summer of 1966, I had the remarkable good fortune to see and hear Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. in the pulpit. As the incoming president of the campus YMCA, an opportunity arose near summer's end for me to attend a workshop in Chicago on urban poverty. The workshop was sponsored by the National Student Council of YMCAs. During the 1950s, the National Council of YMCAs had taken a position favoring integration. In response, the Mississippi State Administration at the time demanded that the MSU YMCA cease its affiliation with the National Council. In our era, we therefore remained independent of the national organization, but Kermit our director, arranged for me to attend as a southern area delegate anyway. This led to my first flight on a commercial airplane and a week-plus trip in late August 1966. The conference lasted from Sunday, August 28th to Thursday, September 1, 1966, and was held at the Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago. The conference was run by theology students involved with, with the Chicago Freedom Movement. A summer-long protest led by Dr. Martin Luther King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference over segregated, terrible living conditions for African Americans in Chicago. My first impression of the student conference was off-putting. The opening prayer reeked with profanity. In poor taste, I thought to myself, not the brand of Christianity I wanted. I lightened up, however, as the conference proceeded. On our first full day, we plunged into the city slums in small groups of four or five, each led by one of the theology students. Plunge became the conference theme, and plunge we did. In our first day, I saw more poverty than anyone could ever want to see and those ragged and filthy grass-free blocks. We felt broken glass beneath our shoes and smelled rotting buildings, many built as temporary housing after the Chicago fire in 1871. All rat-infested, yet all still occupied. One school suffered under a thunderous elevated train track. No child could have heard herself think there, much less learn. Due to race discrimination in employment, African Americans lost out on good jobs, so they lacked funds to live anywhere outside the ghetto, even if discriminatory housing policies had not had been reformed. It was a vicious cycle. Before I went to this conference, I had thought the average black did not care much about the issue of urban poverty. Mayor Richard Daley had famously said in 1963, there are no ghettos in Chicago, and I had given him the benefit of the doubt. But now our eyes and noses told us otherwise. He was so wrong. I came away convinced that the entire black community cared deeply about the problem and that widespread discrimination against individuals accumulated to a systemic evil on a large scale. Near the end of the conference, one of the conference organizers, a student at the Chicago Theological Seminary, invited me and my conference roommate to join him at a mass meeting after dinner in support of the Chicago Freedom Project. The main event was to be Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., who had been dividing his time between the Meredith March and Chicago, but was now back in Chicago full-time. This was not an official conference activity, but a proposed adventure of our own. We accepted the invitation. No one since has had the presence Dr. King had in those days, 
By 1966, he already loomed larger than life. Ten years earlier, he had led the Montgomery bus boycott, ignited by Mrs. Rosa Parks. He co-founded and led the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, battled vicious discrimination in Birmingham, electrified the March on Washington with his I Have a Dream oration, walked at the head of the Selma to Montgomery March, and unapologetically insisted that the Kennedy and Johnson administration push hard for civil rights legislation. He had won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964. All over the South, however, were billboards showing a photograph of Dr. King supposedly attending a communist training camp. Hated, loved, feared, admired, ridiculed, and praised, Dr. King was then the subject of passionately divided opinion. His battlegrounds had all been in the South. Now, however, Dr. King and the SCLC had joined a new front, an assault on a northern ghetto and its root causes, job and housing discrimination. Earlier that summer, he had led a march from Soldier Field to City Hall to affix a copy of the movement's demands to the front door. Heckled and harassed, he strode out front into the white neighborhoods like Gage Park, then to the doorsteps of realtors who openly practiced race discrimination. After a march through an all-white neighborhood on August 5, when King was stoned by thugs, he said that he had not seen such hostility and hate even in Mississippi and Alabama. In only the 36 months preceding the summer of 1966, assassins and mobs had killed, among many others, Medgar Evers, Michael Schwerner, James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, Viola Liozzo, four young girls at the Birmingham 16th Street Baptist Church, and, of course, President Kennedy. Dr. King himself had been the intended target of bombings in Alabama and stone throwings in Chicago. He had been jailed, tear-gassed, smeared as a communist, and hounded by the FBI. He had stood up to Bull Connor in Birmingham, Sheriff Clark in Selma, and Mayor Daley in Chicago. Surrounded by a smoldering white mob, that very summer in Philadelphia, Mississippi, he had confronted Deputy Sheriff Cecil Ray Price face-to-face with, you're the one who had Schwerner and those fellows in jail. He then pointedly told the mob, I believe in my heart that the murderers are somewhere around me at this moment. He was right. Dr. King's own life remained in constant danger. After dinner on Wednesday, August 31, 1966, the three of us went down to the south side on the elevated train. As we exited, we got caught up in the gathering flood of spirited attendees moving toward the Liberty Baptist Church, where a large high-ceilinged sanctuary brimmed almost full an hour before the meeting's scheduled start. We sat two-thirds of the way back, three white faces in a sea of dark ones, about 2,000 altogether. As the time drew near, more and more humanity pressed into the pews until all were jammed hard against one another. Many stood. The evening light of midsummer had faded from the large sanctuary windows when, well after the appointed hour, after others had rallied the room, A slight commotion stirred among the entourage near the pastor's entrance. Then, without formality of introduction, there before us stood Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Physically, Dr. King stood shorter than I had expected. He had broad shoulders and seemed most solid. He wore a dark suit and a white shirt and tie. His face showed weariness and determination. There were no broad smiles or celebratory handshakes. Once he appeared, the mood went from jubilance to reverence. The assemblage hushed. 
Dr. King began speaking softly and slowly, matter-of-factly, as if finding his meter. The weariness in his voice seemed at first to match his face. He had come from a meeting with Mayor Richard Daly, he said, the reason for his lateness. He spoke calmly of the day's negotiations, its details, the very news the hall wished to hear. Soon, however, chants of black power drowned him out. Dr. King asked if someone wished to speak. A SNCC leader, Albert Monroe Sharp, stepped forward and addressed the meeting. His main point was opposition to even negotiating with the white power structure. A few days later, I summarized his point as follows. When I was at the rally, Monroe Sharp and his SNCC crew chanted black power until King let him speak. He explained black power is simply black people realizing that they were people and that they could be successful if they tried. They had to be proud, not ashamed of being black. They had to shun the white man's welfare that kept him in poverty and build economic strength of their own. When Dr. King resumed, he disagreed with Sharp and remarked that whenever the Pharaoh wanted to keep the slaves in bondage, he kept them fighting among themselves, a remark that was more warmly received than Sharp's interruption had been, which had only received polite applause. Dr. King suggested a dress-in at a well-known department store in Chicago that wouldn't negotiate with their union. He announced that another march would be necessary the next morning, scheduled to leave from that very church. Finally, Dr. King moved on to the familiar themes of the movement. His voice found a pulpit cadence. He stressed the need for nonviolence, described the fallacy of violence, and reiterated the irresistibility of peaceful protest. History is on our side. Justice is on our side. God is on our side. Keep the faith. Keep the peace. He used only plain speech and the human voice, both whisper and anthem, but they came from his heart and moved us. I was moved. <laughs>